Anthropocentrism, from Greek Ancient Greek, Anthropos Anthropos, human being, and Ancient Greek, Kontron Kontron, center, is the belief that human beings are the most important entity in the universe. Anthropocentrism interprets or regards the world in terms of human values and experiences. The term can be used interchangeably with humanocentrism, and some refer to the concept as human supremacy or human exceptionalism. Anthropocentrism is considered to be profoundly embedded in many modern human cultures and conscious acts. It is a major concept in the field of environmental ethics and environmental philosophy, where it is often considered to be the root cause of problems created by human action within the ecosphere. However, many proponents of anthropocentrism state that this is not necessarily the case. They argue that a sound long term view acknowledges that a healthy, sustainable environment is necessary for humans and that the real issue is shallow anthropocentrism. <laughs> <laughs> environmental philosophy Anthropocentrism, also known as homocentricism or human supremacism, has been posited by some environmentalists, in such books as Confessions of an Eco-Warrior by Dave Foreman and Green Rage by Christopher Maines, as the underlying if unstated, reason why humanity dominates and sees the need to «develop» most of the Earth. Anthropocentrism is believed by some to be the central problematic concept in environmental philosophy, where it is used to draw attention claims of a systematic bias in traditional Western attitudes to the non-human world. Val Plumwood has argued that anthropocentrism plays an analogous role in green theory to androcentrism in feminist theory and ethnocentrism in anti-racist theory. Plumwood calls human-centeredness, anthrocentrism, to emphasize this parallel. One of the first extended philosophical essays addressing environmental ethics, John Passmore's Man's Responsibility for Nature has been criticized by defenders of deep ecology because of its anthropocentrism, often claimed to be constitutive of traditional Western moral thought. Indeed, defenders of anthropocentrism concerned with the ecological crisis contend that the maintenance of a healthy, sustainable environment is necessary for human well-being as opposed to for its own sake. The problem with a shallow Viewpoint is not that it is human-centered but that according to William Gray, "...what's wrong with shallow views is not their concern about the well-being of humans, but that they do not really consider enough in what that well-being consists. According to this view, we need to develop an enriched, fortified anthropocentric notion of human interest to replace the dominant short-term, sectional and self-regarding conception." In turn, Plumwood in Environmental Culture, the Ecological Crisis of Reason argued that Gray's anthropocentrism is inadequate. It is important to take note that many devoted environmentalists encompass a somewhat anthropocentric based philosophical view supporting the fact that they will argue in favor of saving the environment for the sake of human populations. Gray writes, We should be concerned to promote a rich, diverse, and vibrant biosphere. Human flourishing may certainly be included as a legitimate part of such a flourishing. Such a concern for human flourishing amidst the flourishing of life as a whole, however, is said to be indistinguishable from that of deep ecology and biocentrism, which has been proposed as both an antithesis of anthropocentrism, and as a generalized form of anthropocentrism. <laughs> Judeo Christian tradition Maimonides, a scholar of the Torah who lived in the 12th century AD, was noted for being decidedly anti-anthropocentric. Maimonides called man, a mere drop of the bucket, and not the axle of the world. He also claimed that anthropocentric thinking is what causes humans to think that evil things exist in nature. According to Rabbi Norman Lamb, Maimonides thus deflate d man's extravagant notions of his own importance and urge d us to abandon these illusions." In the 1985 CBC series, A Planet for the Taking, Dr. David Suzuki explored the Old Testament roots of anthropocentrism and how it shaped our view of non-human animals. Some Christian proponents of anthropocentrism base their belief on the Bible, such as the verse 126 in the book of Genesis, and God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. The use of the word, dominion, in the Genesis is controversial. 
Many biblical scholars, especially Roman Catholic and other non-Protestant Christians, consider this to be a flawed translation of a word meaning stewardship, which would indicate that mankind should take care of the earth and its various forms of life. Topic: <laughs> Human rights. Anthropocentrism is the grounding for some naturalistic concepts of human rights. Defenders of anthropocentrism argue that it is the necessary fundamental premise to defend universal human rights, since what matters morally is simply being human. For example, noted philosopher Mortimer J. Adler wrote, "...those who oppose injurious discrimination on the moral ground that all human beings, being equal in their humanity, should be treated equally in all those respects that concern their common humanity, would have no solid basis in fact to support their normative principle." Adler is stating here, that denying what is now called human exceptionalism could lead to tyranny, writing that if we ever came to believe that humans do not possess a unique moral status, the intellectual foundation of our liberties collapses. Why, then, should not groups of superior men be able to justify their enslavement, exploitation, or even genocide of inferior human groups on factual and moral grounds akin to those we now rely on to justify our treatment of the animals we harness as beasts of burden, that we butcher for food and clothing, or that we destroy as disease-bearing pests or as dangerous predators? Author and anthropocentrism defender Wesley J. Smith from the Discovery Institute has written that human exceptionalism is what gives rise to human duties to each other, the natural world, and to treat animals humanely. Writing in A Rat as a Pig as a Dog as a Boy, a critique of animal rights ideology, because we are unquestionably a unique species, the only species capable of even contemplating ethical issues and assuming responsibilities. We uniquely are capable of apprehending the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, proper and improper conduct toward animals. Or to put it more succinctly if being human isn't what requires us to treat animals humanely, what in the world does? <laughs> Cognitive psychology In cognitive psychology, anthropocentric thinking can be defined as the tendency to reason about unfamiliar biological species or processes by analogy to humans." Reasoning by analogy is an attractive thinking strategy, and it can be tempting to apply our own experience of being human to other biological systems. For example, because death is commonly felt to be undesirable, it may be tempting to form the misconception that death at a cellular level or elsewhere in nature is similarly undesirable whereas in reality programmed cell death is an essential physiological phenomenon, and ecosystems also rely on death. Conversely, anthropocentric thinking can also lead people to underattribute human characteristics to other organisms. For instance, it may be tempting to wrongly assume that an animal that is very different from humans, such as an insect, will not share particular biological characteristics, such as reproduction or blood circulation. Anthropocentric thinking has predominantly been studied in young children, mostly up to the age of 10, by developmental psychologists interested in its relevance to biology education. Although relatively little is known about its persistence at a later age, evidence exists that this pattern of human exceptionalist thinking can continue through young adulthood, even among students who have been increasingly educated in biology. The notion that anthropocentric thinking is an innate human characteristic has been challenged by study of American children raised in urban environments, among whom it appears to emerge between the ages of three and five years as an acquired perspective. Children's recourse to anthropocentric thinking seems to vary with experience and cultural assumptions about the place of humans in the natural world. Children raised in rural environments appear to use it less than their urban counterparts because of their greater familiarity with different species of animals and plants. Studies involving children from some of the indigenous peoples of the Americas have found little use of anthropocentric thinking. Study of children among the witchy people in South America showed a tendency to think of living organisms in terms of their taxonomic or perceived similarities, ecological considerations, and animistic traditions, resulting in a much less anthropocentric view of the natural world than is experienced by many children in Western societies. In popular culture In fiction from all eras and societies, there is fiction treating as normal the actions of humans to ride, eat, milk, and otherwise treat animals as separate species. 
There are occasional exceptions, such as talking animals, but they are generally treated as exceptions, as aberrations to the rule distinguishing people from animals. In science fiction, humanocentrism is the idea that humans, as both beings and as a species, are the superior sentience. Essentially the equivalent of racial supremacy on a galactic scale, it entails intolerant discrimination against sentient non-humans, much like race supremacists discriminate against those not of their race. A prime example of this concept is utilized as a story element for the Mass Effect series. After humanity's first contact results in a brief war, many humans in the series develop suspicious or even hostile attitudes towards the game's various alien races. By the time of the first game, which takes place several decades after the war, many humans still retain such sentiments in addition to forming pro-human organizations. This idea is countered by anti-humanism. At times, this ideal also includes fear of and superiority over strong AIs and cyborgs, downplaying the ideas of integration, cybernetic revolts, machine rule and Tilden's laws of robotics. Mark Twain mocked the belief in human supremacy in Letters from the Earth written c. 1909, published 1962. The 2012 documentary The Superior Human, systematically analyzes anthropocentrism and concludes that value is fundamentally an opinion, and since life forms naturally value their own traits, most humans are misled to believe that they are actually more valuable than other species. This natural bias, according to the film, combined with a received sense of comfort and an excuse for exploitation of non-humans cause anthropocentrism to remain in society. Topic. See also Topic. References Topic. Further reading Berta Lanfee, Ludwig von General System Theory, Foundations, Development, Applications pp. 239–48 Bodice, Rob, ed. 2011. Anthropocentrism: Humans, Animals, Environments. Leiden and Boston: Brill. Jensen, Derek. 2016. The Myth of Human Supremacy. Seven Stories Press. ISBN 9781609806781. Seigel, Michael T. May 2002. Religion, Science, and Environment. Meeting of the Victorian Medico Legal Society. Pacifica, 16 1. Brunswick, Australia, Pacifica Theological Studies Association published February 2003. pp. 67-88. ISSN 1030-570X. Archived from the original PDF on 21 March 2012. Retrieved the 22nd of July 2012. Watson, Paul June 2016. Human lives are not more important than animal lives. White, Lynn Townsend Jr. The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis. Science, Volume 155, Number 3767, the 10th of March 1967, pp 1203 to 1207.